Good morning. My name is Mel Gonzalez Vasquez, a senior political science international relations major, co-secretary of the Latin American Student Organization and the co-chair for Casa del Sol. Today, October 1st, 2021, I hold the honor of introducing Carleton's Hispanic Heritage Month convocation speaker sponsored by the Office of Intercultural Life is Amalia Moreno Damgard. Moreno Damgard is an award-winning author and chef entrepreneur born and raised in Guatemala City with a prior corporate career. Through Amalia, Latin Gourmet, a women's business enterprise, National Council certified women-owned business, Enterprise, she helps organizations of all sizes develop a broader understanding and appreciation for Latin cultural nuances, using traditional healthy cuisine as a platform for keynote speaking, representing brands, consulting, and teaching. She is the co-founder and president slash CEO emeritus and chief board advisor of Women Entrepreneurs of Minnesota, a 501c6 nonprofit fostering women entrepreneurship through leadership, education, and mentoring. Moreno Damgard's best-selling book, Amalia's Guatemalan Kitchen, Gourmet Cuisine with a Cultural Flair, is a personal memoir and recipe collection designed to encourage and empower people to explore new foods to and cook more fresh meals at home for health and wellness. The book won nine international awards, and she will publish her second book this year. A graduate of the prestigious Le Cordon Bleu with a master's in international business from St. Louis University, Moreno Damgard has a long history of philanthropy and board service. She serves on the board of the National Association of Women Business Owners Minnesota, Open Arms of Minnesota, and Les Dames de Ecofier International Minnesota. Recently, Amalia was recognized by the U.S. Small Business Administration, Women Venture, and the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal with the Champion of the Year Award, the Catalyst Award, and as a Woman in Business honoree, respectively. As a self-described triple minority immigrant living in Minnesota, Moreno Damgard faced challenges stemming from gender, ethnicity, and cultural misunderstanding, both socially and in work. She is passionate not only about inspiring others to self-empowerment, but also fostering better understanding and appreciation of Latin American cultural nuances through healthy gourmet cuisine and culture education. The title of her Hispanic Heritage Month Convocation presentation is Multicultural Insights from a Self-Proclaimed Triple Minority. Now please, help me in welcoming Amalia Moreno Damgard to Carleton College. <laughs> Wow, what an introduction. Thank you so much, Melissa. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Thank you so much, Kerry, for inviting me to speak today. Happy fall, happy Hispanic Heritage Month. This is a deja vu moment for me. It reminds me of my college days. So it's a, a, warm, a warm feeling. So I often get the question, Amalia, how did you go from banker to chef entrepreneur? And I say, self-empowerment. Self-empowerment is about embracing your roots, embracing who you are, and self-empowerment in the age of multi multiculturalism, I believe, is necessary, whether you are a student, whether you are a teacher, whether you are a person in business, and so on. Because if we don't self-empower, no one is going to do it for us. And that can be the difference between feeling stuck or advancing one's career. Let me elaborate on this. Self-empowerment is courage, confidence, and believing in yourself. Public speaking is one of the top three fears in people's lives. The image that you see on the large screen, it's me presenting to a group of 300 women, professional women that is, in downtown Minneapolis some, some time ago. 
Do I look comfortable? No notes inside? Perhaps, but it wasn't always that way. For me, this was a scary moment. But I did not let that stop me. I used to be a shy person. I used to have many fears. Fear of having an accent, feeling of being a triple minority, feel, fear of being judged, fear of looking different, fear of being looked at from head to toe, and most importantly, making a fool of myself in front of others was one of my biggest fears. Does that sound familiar? But I did not let that stop me either. Life's circumstances pushed me in this direction. One day in my first career, I was sent to Washington DC to present to the Export Import Bank of the United States to a group of corporate executives. I had no prior experience in public speaking. I had seen my coworkers, my peers do it, and I felt if they could do it, so could I. Today, I have gone from presenting to an almost empty room, to very large crowds, and even regularly on TV and radio. This has been a gradual process. I had been in the US for only a few years when I just started public speaking. I was an immigrant with many fears, but with a lot of desire to do well in my new home. I wanted to learn about the traditions. I wanted to learn about the customs. I wanted to embrace this country wholeheartedly. So I worked hard and smart at polishing my English language skills by taking, I don't know how many ESL classes, English as a second language classes, that is. I went to college, then to graduate school, then to professional culinary school, and then I felt the need to polish my speaking skills. So I went to the National Speakers Association as well. I wanted to feel confident, I wanted to make a difference, and I wanted to function in my new home professionally and efficiently. I am now the author of two books. I have created two businesses, and I continue to have very high goals. It has been a hard journey, but that hasn't stopped me. This slide shows part of my journey and some of the highlights of my life and career. They are intermingled. Each one represents a series of learning curves all full of challenges as well as opportunities. The picture on the top left is me in my home country, Guatemala. Behind me is my play pal, Paco. Some of you may know that Paco is a nickname for Francisco in Latin America. 
it appears as if I am playing hard to get. But behind the innocence of this pic picture lies a different story. I was abandoned by my mother when I was a child. This was an experience that left me crying myself to sleep at night because I missed my siblings, because I missed my father, because I miss my familiar surroundings. And recovering from this experience is a process that took years. But I did not let that stop me either. I chose to become a stronger woman instead. The picture that you see in the middle left is my maternal grandmother. She is the person that I ended up living with when my mother decided that she did not want to take care of me. This woman was a blessing in my life. She was my inspiration. She inspired me to entrepreneurship and she inspired me to healthy cooking, healthy eating. I didn't know it then, but I know it now. She was an entrepreneur herself. She was divorced, she never remarried. She had a store that catered to the needs of her small town. She lived about five hours away from Guatemala City from the home I was removed. In a town called Quesaltepeque, Chiquimula, closest to the border to El Salvador. Besides entrepreneurship lessons, I learned many other things from her. From her. She had very strong morals. And again, I did not realize it then, but I realize it now how important that has been in my life as a professional woman and as a mother and as a wife. I used to go to the markets with my grandmother because by the way, she was an excellent cook. She cooked all meals from scratch. She made cheese, she made all the meals that we had every day at home. I used to not only go to the market, but I used to watch her and help her in the kitchen at that time with whatever she would let me do. I didn't know it then, but I know now that that is where I got the inspiration for my passion today. She inspired me to healthy eating, healthy cooking. So she, in essence, gave me healthy cooking lessons for life. We never know when these examples that we have early on in life are going to come into a different career, are going to come in, in, in a different way as a rewarding, rewarding experience in the form of a business. My grandmother has become and is and will be my first mentor and my life's pillar. Mentors are so important in our lives and we never stop needing them. I ask you, do you have a role model and mentor in your life? The picture that you see on the bottom left, it's me when I started my first career in banking. 
I am sitting at my desk, and this picture was taken the day I became a U.S. citizen. This is the reason why I'm wearing this Uncle Sam hat. It was a happy day. My coworkers had prepared this party for me. It was a surprise. I didn't know it. In my first career, I was so fortunate to rotate in operations in the international department. Lucky me, I got to learn a lot of different jobs within the time that I worked there. Then I progressed to business development, trade finance, and so on. This is where I formed a strong core to start my business. These are building blocks. As we grow older, as we start our first careers, as we progress through life, all these experiences leave a mark on us, the good ones and the bad ones. It is up to us to decide which ones to choose and how to self-empower ourselves. I progressed from this opportunity in banking, and I worked for actually five banks. As a result of mergers and acquisitions uh, that the banks I work for, um, this happened in the 90s, where there were a lot of mergers uh, going on. So the banks that I work for were all absorbed by major banks such as Bank of America, U.S. Bank, and eventually Wells Fargo. And that was the last bank uh, that, I, that I worked for. But again, this first job, this first career, formed a very, very strong core in my life and gave me the strong foundation to start my business. The picture that you see in the middle, it's me and my son, he was 13 then, in the kitchen. This is a shot that was taken by a magazine that was doing a feature story on me and my family. I've, I've, I have always involved him in the kitchen with me. And remember those strong morals and healthy cooking lessons that I learned from my grandmother, I have passed them to him. This is my main, my, my, my main person, my, my main project, my main everything in life. The most important being in my life, my son. He's my pride and joy and I want to be a good role model for him, and I want to be a good mother for him, and I want to be a good guide for him. He's now 23 years old. He graduated this May from Washington University in St. Louis. And as we speak, he is driving to LA to start his acting career. As excited as I am, I am heartbroken because I know that I am not going to see him for a long time, but I know that he, he, is, he has flown. He's gone for a while. I will not see him for, for a long time. My husband and best friend was born and raised in Copenhagen, Denmark. So he brings another cultural dimension to my life and my kitchen as well. We met five banks ago, where we both started our international banking careers. As immigrants and business professionals, we have worked hard and smart, building quality relationships 
socially and in business. We know that constant networking and relationship building can help you discover opportunities. My question for you is, how often do you network and do you make that intentional? This next slide shows my, the rest of my journey. It is the highlights of my life and career. Again, they are intermingled. Each one represents a series of learning curves, all full of challenges and opportunities. The logos that you see on the left first one is my business, and the second one is the organization I co-founded. After spending almost 20 years in international banking, I transitioned to full-time entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is a way of self-empowerment. It has been very hard but it has been very rewarding. And the hard part has not stopped me. Amalia Latin Gourmet, the mission for my business was born out of social and cultural misunderstanding situations. When I had been in the U.S. only a few months, someone asked me, Amalia, where are you from? And I said, I am from Guatemala. Then they asked again, where is that in Mexico? I encountered this situation many times, and I thought to myself, I have to do something about this someday. And I did. So the mission of my business is to help individuals and organizations bridge the knowledge gap and develop a broader understanding and appreciation of Latin cultural nuances using gourmet cuisine as a platform and my two books to foster cultural understanding through speaking, consulting, and experiences. And in the process, also, I foster diversity, equity, and inclusion. Women Entrepreneurs of Minnesota is a 501c6 nonprofit that was formed to foster women entrepreneurship through leadership education, peer advisory, and mentoring. I co-founded this group because I wanted to help women start their own businesses. I wanted to foster women entrepreneurship. I also wanted to have a support group because at the time when I started my business, this is 2007, when Women Entrepreneurs of Minnesota came into being, there were not very many support groups out there. So we were all like-minded women that needed support and we didn't have a place to go. So we formed this group. We formed a board of directors. So Women Entrepreneurs of Minnesota is 14 years old and thriving. Women Entrepreneurs of Minnesota is 16 years old and thriving. The logo that you see on the bottom of WeBank, WeBank is the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. Amalia Latin Gourmet is now a nationally certified woman-owned business enterprise. This is the highest accreditation that a business can receive for a, from a highly recognized 
accreditation company in the country. It can help connect you to uh, companies in the country and possibly internationally, but it can also help open new doors. The picture on the bottom, middle, is my first book, and I call it my first baby. I call it my first baby uh, because it is something that you give birth to. A book is a creation from within. Amalia's Guatemalan Kitchen has been a very successful book that inspired me to do another one. It's not only a recipe book, as everything I do is under my mission, it is also to foster cultural understanding of Guatemalan cuisine and culture. My second book, which you see at the top, is about to launch uh, on October 7th, and by the way, you're all invited. If you're interested, please connect with me afterwards. This is a book that is Guatemala-centric, and again, it fosters cultural understanding and appreciation. It goes deeper into the Mesoamerica culture, which is the Central America isthmus connected to the southern part of Mexico. It's a very rich region in traditions and culture. It's a center of agriculture. The book has 130 traditional healthy recipes, and then there is a picture for every dish. I love this picture because it places me in what I call my happy place, the kitchen, a therapeutic place where delicious creations can happen, where family bonding can take place where we can teach the family many things. We can teach them about healthy eating, healthy cooking. We can teach them about culture history. We can teach them about ingredients that they may have seen at the grocery store, but they don't know what to do with. But better yet, we can teach by example by cooking healthy meals at home and making this a habit of doing this with the family, especially when the children are young, this fosters healthy eating later in life. So these three words, heart, instinct, and palate, pretty much summarize how I run my life and my businesses. So I say that I connect to my heart, to stay true to myself. I know who I am. I also draw on my instinct when I am faced with challenging situations. Your instinct is your gut. When you know that, or you feel that perhaps you should not do something. And then my palate connects me to my roots, and that is a happy place for me as well. I am very proud of being raised and being from Guatemala. I know that being different, I know that being multicultural, I know that being bilingual, I know that having views different from those of other people have a lot of value in this country. And I like to share that with everyone because I am proud of who I am. I am proud of being Latin American. I am proactive rather than reactive. So everything that has happened to me since I came to this country 
has been because I've been proactive, looking for opportunities, educating myself, relationship, making relationships, creating relationships, cultivating those relationships, networking like crazy. I continue to do that because you cannot rest on your laurels. You, ha you have to continue learning. You have to continue doing all these things that connect you to your goals. I like to share that also I mentor other women. I mentor other people that look for mentoring. I like to empower to do what they want to do. But I also serve on boards for the reason that that is networking, for the reason that that is also relationship building, and for the reason that it's a circle. Everything that you do, good or bad, comes back to you. And all those things are good. And I know that this is volunteer work that is going to come back to me in good ways, and it has. So I have had a long history of community work and board service and of philanthropy. This state is so wonderful, supporting so many good causes. There are many opportunities to connect to philanthropy. I encourage you to look for opportunities to do that. It's a good thing. Relationship building, remember, is going to be important today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your lives. So I want to ask you this. Do you pay attention to all those building blocks in your life? in terms of personal relationships, in terms of student relationships, instead of business relationships. Paying attention to your path can help you see where you can potentially start a business. It can help you in self-discovery if you yet don't know what you are going to do after you graduate. But just thinking about your life and thinking about your experiences, thinking about your aspirations, is going to be very, very helpful when you connect them to your own experiences because each one of us is very unique. And every speaker that you will have here throughout the week has a very different journey for that reason, because we all have very different experiences. This slide places me in a classroom earlier when I started my second career. I have always known that teaching and speaking and being around academia, I love that. That's why I love being here. It's good. Why? Because we need to continue learning. We graduate school. We graduate uh, from, from life. But we never stop learning. Even as a business owner, you never stop learning. As an author, you never stop learning. This is my second book right here. When I finish this book, I go, now what? I still have more to say, but the book is already 400 pages. And I found out that I, going to, I am going to do another book because of that, because I have more to say, and because I have discovered that the more I know, the more I realize how little I know. Does that make sense? Education is so, so important. The formation that you get in a university, in a college, it's so pivotal in your life. And I always say that 
if you're not familiar with a, uh, a concept that um, allows you to think in terms of how education is important in your, in your life, um, you should look for ways to apply what you know in a very strategic way. And if you don't know how to do that, I encourage you to look for a mentor. You never stop needing mentors. My first mentor I mentioned was my grandmother. She's been my life's pillar. Throughout my two careers, I, I've had a number of mentors. Why? Because as soon as you learn something, you realize that there is, the grass is always greener and you need to continue to, to learn to grow. And you need to learn to control your fears. When you do scary things, you may have heard this before, it's a good thing. You self-empower yourself. Scary things are good. Because if you don't do them, you don't know if you're going to be able to conquer the fear, first of all, but you don't know what lies on the other side. It could be an opportunity for a job, better job. It could be an opportunity to start a business and so on. So it is a good thing to do it. So we live today, perhaps, in the most dynamic point in, in uh, history, the 21st century, where information, technology, and multiculturalism are changing the world we live in constantly. The, the pandemic has challenged us in so many different ways and we have pivoted in many different ways as well. Change brings challenges, but also many opportunities for self-empowerment and improvement. All of us have a great potential for doing great things in life, and many people die without realizing their dreams. Why? because of fear, because of lack of confidence, because of maybe both. When I started my first career, I was a shy person. I had self-doubt. I had fears. I had lack of confidence, but that didn't stop me. I still encounter these feelings, they will never go away. But I feel better equipped now to manage them, to deal with them. I choose to self-empower. I'll leave you with this. What is that something that is stopping you from achieving your next goal? What is that something that is keeping you from your dream? Is it fear? Is it lack of self-confidence? Is it lack of commitment? Or is it both? And will you let that stop you? Thank you for listening. We have some time for questions, so if you uh, have a question, raise your hand and I'll bring this microphone out to you so we can all hear your question. So who's got the first one right over here? Hi, thank you very much for your empowering presentation um, and sharing all this information about your life and where you, where you come from and, and who was your and, and I really appreciate hearing about your grandmother and how you talk about the values that you have, but 
how you're not aware of what you're getting while it's happening. I think it's a very important message. Um, you talk about m cultural misunderstandings. I'm very interested. I teach a class, and the first book we read is called Cultural Misunderstanding. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, more about what what your experience of that. You, you mentioned already, um, you know, the misconceptions uh, and that you were trying to address in your books. And I'm wondering if maybe you might mention a few more or if that overlaps with maybe some obstacles that you faced. Thank you. Absolutely, and thank you for your comments. Um, cultural misunderstanding is not, know, is not just not knowing the difference between a Guatemalan and a Colombian and a uh, Argentinian. It goes beyond that, it goes very deep. This year we have embraced Again, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which was ignited by the horrible tragedy that happened last year. It's a good thing. Cultural awareness at work, at a school, at a college, can translate into inclusion. It doesn't matter where you come from, you can be Latino, African-American, Asian, or Caucasian. We are a diverse country. We are a multicultural country. And we are growing so rapidly into multi multiculturalism faster than ever. Some people have referred to this as the browning of America. It's like a wave that is sweeping from the west onto the east. That multiculturalism is posing a lot of challenges for everyone, for every industry. Why? Because we've never experienced such numbers of people, so many diverse peoples. We don't know how to deal with them because we don't understand them. And the way to understand them is to sit down, invite them to the table, and eat, which is what I love to do. Visit with them. Sit down with them. Have them share their story, like I did with you today. Deepening the knowledge about different nationalities is going to help with the, not only the cultural understanding, but how to be more inclusive. There are other examples on diversity that you can embrace celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, celebrating the Day of the Dead. Why is the Day of the Dead important in Mexico and Guatemala, where those two countries have this fervor about the Day of the Dead? What does it mean? Why do they do it? Just realize that U.S. is a very young country versus the rest of the world. Latin America is very ancient, right? We have a lot of stories to tell. We're rich in culture. We're rich in history. Our food is great. Our music is hot. It is, and I'm proud of that. Our food is delicious but it goes beyond tacos. Take the time to understand what it is that makes everyone different. And the only way that we are going to do it is by inviting them to the table. Have open conversations. Be intentional about it. Many companies, many organizations are now being more intentional by hiring chief diversity officer in their companies. Now they have a position for someone that is doing nothing but that. And we're starting to see some of the results of that. The media, the movies, government, politics, minority representation is still lacking there. Why? For all those reasons that I am talking about. Inclusion is a big thing, and inclusion is hard to do. Why? Because 
People are uncomfortable with what's different, what they cannot connect with. And the only way to break that barrier is to invite people to have conversations and dialogue. So my recommendation for you would be start with round table discussions. Pick a theme. Maybe the theme is different every time you meet. Have people share for five minutes a little bit about their story based on that theme. Have them bring a meal, say five course meal. Have someone bring a dessert from a one country, have another person bring a salad, an entree, and make that into a theme. Why do you eat the way you do? You can learn so much about somebody through food. That's why I love what I do. Because to me, food fits everywhere. Everybody loves to eat. And the food looks good. It's inviting. People want to eat it. But then they're curious about what happens behind the food. Every food, every dish, there's an opportunity to tell stories, whether that is historical, cultural, or anecdotal. I have many anecdotes of my time cooking with my grandmother. So I hope I helped you a little bit. What do you think was the biggest challenge you faced in starting your own business? Remember I said that I am a self-proclaimed triple minority? That. And what that means is I am a woman. I am a minority within another minority. That makes sense? This is still a man's world. It is more difficult for a woman to start run a business or to advance in a company than it is for a man. A woman still faces challenges today. Remember I come from corporate and now I have my own business and it hasn't changed. You see things happening around you. No one talks about them, but you notice them. And what is that? Forever, the world has been male-dominated. That mentality has not gone away. Maybe it will never go away in my lifetime. But the things that I wanted to do earlier or that I wanted them to happen faster, it's taking me longer to get there. Then you see someone else that may be male and may have just started, and because of the perception, they may be given bigger opportunities. This is a, a study at the college level, at the graduate school level. I just took a course with Cornell University on women's entrepreneurship, and that was one of the main topics we discussed, the challenges that women still face in this society, but not just here in the States. In other countries, it's worse. You go to Latin America, then you are faced with machismo. And you go to Europe, you're gonna encounter similar situations. You go to the Middle East, it's gonna be even worse. You've seen everything that is happening in Afghanistan and the rights of women. So that has been my biggest challenge. Trying to grow faster than I could, trying to penetrate certain areas. And I have been frustrated at times, but I say always, I don't let anything stop me. I will find a way, even if it takes me twice as long, I will go around it I will go over it, I will jump over it, I will find a connection, I will find a mentor to help me get there. Don't let anything stop you from your goals and from your dreams. Other questions?
Hello, thank you so much for your presentation. I hope this isn't too vague of a question, but I am, I'm not from the US, I'm from Barbados, and I'm also a freshman, and this is my first time in the States. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about your transition coming from Guatemala to the US and how you adjusted, if that's okay. You know, that is an excellent question, and you are making me uh, relive things that perhaps I haven't revisited in a while, but they are still there. Um, I can tell you that when I left home, I was 19 years old. I left, and I don't know, I don't think I had any fears at that time. When you're younger, you're less fearful. You think the world it belongs to you. So I left. I was very sad to leave my home country, but I was very excited to come here. I started in banking almost immediately, within a year that I, that I came here. And then I started learning a new culture. Then I started taking a lot of classes to learn better English. I already spoke good English because in Guatemala, you're required to take English as a second language. But I was rusty. I wanted to polish my English. I wanted to learn more. But one major thing that happened to me is I felt lost in space for a while. There is something that happens to us immigrants when we go from our home country to another place, to another totally different country with different customs, traditions, and a language that is not your own. Look, I published two books written on a language that is not my native language. How did I do that? I don't know, but I don't let anything stop me, right? So I call that thing that I was telling you about an identity crisis. We all suffer an identity crisis for a while until we get acculturated in this country. We go through this limbo that we don't know where, where we stand. Am I Latina or am I you know, American or am I both? And then you still have your roots very deeply ingrained. So you tend to do things the way you were doing them back home. But then you come here and you realize that's not the way they do things here. So people are going to look at me weird or they're gonna treat me different, right? Because I'm doing different things. Don't stop that, that is good. I say that it took me good eight to 10 years to start feeling myself, to start feeling comfortable to start feeling like, you know, I am a person who belongs in the world. I am happy here. This is the greatest country in the whole world. I wouldn't change that. I love visiting my country, but I love living here. I love the multiculturalism. The identity crisis that you may be experiencing or may not, that will fade. And you will embrace this country wholeheartedly. You will co be comfortable with speaking Spanish, and you will be comfortable with speaking English. And at some, at some point, you are going to blend your culture with the US culture. And it's going to be a happy place. But most importantly, you are going to feel at peace here and here. But that takes time. Did I connect with a little bit of what you may be feeling? Other questions? Um, I am um, thinking about all the students who are here, um, not necessarily for the first time because sophomores are coming here and then they haven't been to campus because of the pandemic. Um, 
And the important thing in college is, men is finding mentors. And I'm wondering if you could say more about how you found your mentors. I'll be happy to do that. So I'm gonna give you an example. When I had the seed of the idea to start my business and I came up with the mission that I shared with you and the reasons behind it, I didn't know how to start a business. So I went to SCORE. Are you familiar with SCORE? S-C-O-R-E. It is a, an organization formed by retired executives, many of which have, many of whom have started companies or many companies or have been in corporate positions and they are now retired. And rather than sitting at home, they want to continue to give back. So they're volunteers. It's a wealth of information, education that you can get from these executives. So I was very, very lucky that early in uh, my career, uh, when I started my business, I landed an executive, a retired executive from the Pillsbury family. How lucky is that? That is one place where you can get mentors. Um, if you're not familiar with SCORE, S-C-O-R-E dot org, look it up, and that is one, one place to, to find mentors. Another place to find uh, mentors is through my web, Women Entrepreneurs of Minnesota group. Uh, we have a mentoring program, and there are many other organizations out there for women that have mentoring programs. Um, you could also start a mentoring program in the college. And the way it's really, it can be very simple, uh, or you can, uh, you know, create a whole program a with a written, you know, uh, program and so on. Uh, but there are many different uh, also ways to find a mentor. I have found mentors sometimes. Uh, say I, I admire someone and I respect someone, or this person has the knowledge that I need. So I'll pick up the phone and I will reach out to them, and I will ask them, would you be my mentor? What is the worst thing they can do? Say no, that doesn't hurt anything, then you find somebody else. So that fear that I talked about, don't be afraid of people, right? Because they can help you connect further and help you grow. So that has been probably for me, the best way to find mentors for me as I move into different you know, facets of my, of my two businesses uh, because you never stop needing mentors. But having one here within your uh, college could be a good thing, something new and you know, um, it could be faculty, I don't know, uh, staff could be mentors. You know, everyone is a wealth of knowledge, right? Every, every head is a, is a world. Uh, but students could mentor each other as well they have different strengths, right? So I would say reach out to someone. That is my number one recommendation. Reach out to someone that you respect. As we wrap up today, do you have a closing comment for the folks here? I want to say thank you again for, for inviting me to speak today. I love academia, I love education, I fully embrace what you do this week. Convocation week is absolutely phenomenal because you're bringing in all the speakers that are going to be sharing so much, so much knowledge. My final recommendation for you is listen to everyone, take notes, but then lo don't let those notes stay in your pocket and then you forget about them. Act on them. If something clicks with you, act on them. That is the benefit of listen, listening to speakers that have experience, work experience, life experience. It doesn't do any good to listen to someone and then dismiss the information later on. It's like going to a class and not taking notes and then not applying that information later on. That would be my recommendation. But also, I want to also ask you to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you're familiar with LinkedIn, start building a professional profile on this very powerful business connection. LinkedIn is not just to find jobs. 
LinkedIn is for building relationships and connecting to people that can help you in your future careers. So with that, thank you again. Thank you very much.